What's going on everybody? Michael and Coco here to do some technical analysis on the financial markets. In today's video, we're going to be looking at three indices. We're going to be looking at some indicators to help determine where these indices might be headed next. And then we're also going to talk about gold, silver, and the US dollar. Let's get into it. All right, welcome back. If it's your first time here, I make these videos Monday through Friday. It gives us a good sense of direction as to where the market might be headed next. Now, the week just came to a close, and it was a big week for the S&P 500. Right now, we're looking at the weekly time frame, and what we got going on here, you can see that this big weekly candle burst through mainly through a lot of stimulus hopes, but we were mapping out the FIB 618 level, and we said that if it breaks above that, we can see a push higher to the upside. In today's video, we're gonna be seeing where that can, price can actually potentially go to and where we might start seeing some hesitation because even though this looks great, it very well might not be. I wanna make sure that we're not walking into a trap here, so we need to just proceed with caution, especially when we look at the seasonality chart in October's so during election years, it's typically a rough trading month. So what do we see here on this time frame? Well, we have this gigantic um, widening wedge pattern, megaphone pattern, you can call it. And really we had this steep pullback in September and now we're seeing the move up. This, this is a pretty aggressive move to the upside. It was an originally a falling wedge and then we kind of just burst burst right through that. So we mapped out these layer, uh, levels previously on other videos around 3,200. And we have an ultimate target down here more towards 3,000. Are we gonna get there? Not too sure. The market really is believing that that stimulus deal will be coming here very soon, which can offer a lot of relief type rally. Now let's go into the daily time frame and get a little bit more granular. So here's zoomed in on the daily time frame, and what we've been mapping out is this um, inverse head and shoulders. So first it was, like I said, the falling wedge, we broke out, then it kind of looked like a bear flag, and then the price action cracked above this 618 level. Now the 618 level is at about 3450, so this neckline of this inverse head and shoulders we broke above. Now what I want to call out here, um, we won't spend much time, is one, on the daily we are over um, past extended the 5 EMA, so that's one thing, and that's a typically very frequently tagged EMA. Once we got you know, pulled right here, we saw a down day, and then it came to, back to reconnect it. You can see it right here, came to back to reconnect it. Most times that it gets disconnected, it comes to reconnect uh, fairly quickly. And we're also kind of moving into the upper Bollinger Band here, so that can also offer up some type of resistance. Doesn't mean that we can't keep continuing to push up. That's not what that means, but it is something to take note of on these type of moves. This is the two hour time frame, and what I wanna highlight here is just the amount of gaps that have been left to open right here. So we have four gaps here in just you know about a month's time, you know late September. And you know that's just a lot of air pockets. Now we can go back and probably find some more, but just recently all these air pockets were moving into an over kind of bot territory right here. It could be very well likely that we do get some sort of a pullback to retest the neckline, and then maybe we can move higher. Um, we'll see how kind of that goes, but the levels that I wanna keep an eye on is gonna be obviously the neckline. So if the price pulls back to that, it was once resistance, it then becomes a level of support. So if we pull back, we might be able to bounce from those levels. The two hour time frame also has that rising wedge kind of still drawn out. We're at the upper portion of it. So a lot of confluence up in this area and you can see it kind of got held up there for the last four hours of trading. Those two candles right there, each one of those represents two hours. So four hours, it kind of got hung up there. Here is the VIX on the daily time frame. We have this big open gap up here and the VIX, if you're not familiar with what the VIX is, this is the volatility index. It typically has an inverse correlation with the S&P 500. So when the VIX typically goes down, you'll see the S&P rise. As you saw here these last couple of days, we cracked below the 50 period moving average. We're watching for this inverse head and shoulders. So it's still kind of holding within this range. This gap down here has been bugging me for quite some time, but if we start kind of getting moving up a little bit and cracking above 37.5, it's very likely that we can come up to the 45, 50, maybe even higher range on some extreme volatility. Heading into the election year, that's very possible to see. Right now, the market is kind of 
really kind of moving towards the, the belief that yes, this stimulus is coming one way or another, we will see. Let's quickly look at the NASDAQ 100 on the weekly time frame. Each one of these candles represents one weeks of data. And as you can see here, we had this uh, falling wedge we broke out. Now it's in bullish context, but it was from a bearish breakdown of a rising channel. So that's not always the greatest type of context. And now we're kind of seeing this push up. We did not get confirmation on this uh, shooting star candle. Obviously what happened is it opened up the next day, pulled down a little bit, but then really ramped up for the remainder of the week coming into that 61.8% Fibonacci retracement level. So there's a very big possibility that we'll get hung up around this area or maybe a little bit higher and retest the lower portion of this trend line. Uh, you know, it's 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 possible and that, that, that to me would make sense. It's also kind of moving into this overbought territory here. So things could get, you know, pretty sticky um, for the NASDAQ 100 here on the weekly time frame, um, probably fairly quickly. Now, if we get a, br a break above 61.8, like I said, the lower trend line is right above it. That 12,000 level could be a very hard level to get through. And, you know, in, in all reality, if we don't get the stimulus or some bad news around this takes place, I mean, we have so many things going on right now. But if that doesn't happen, uh, I don't think really that the Nasdaq's going to reach an all time high right out of the gate on, you know, just just because I think what's going to happen is we'll see it track sideways for quite some time to either down, depending on how the election goes. Here is the IWM. This is the Russell 2000 ETF. And really, it was one of the more stronger looking charts. And I was saying previously, quite some time ago, uh, right around this range, this we mapped out a bull flag and it kind of broke down. This one looked like it had some of the more upside potential, despite what was actually taking place in the economy. And really, when it came down to this 200 period, we saw it go from 143 to 162, relatively in a very short period of time. And you can see that in the RSI. It's really ramping up there to that over sorry, bought territory, I think I said oversold. And right now it looks strong on this breakout. However, there's a couple couple uh, kinks in its armor right now. If you wanna take a look at the two hour time frame, I'll show you. So here is the two hour time frame on the Russell 2000. And first off, as you can see, just a huge move, right? But then what we got going on here is we have a negative divergence in the RSI, looks a little toppy right here. And then we also have the MACD kind of kind of curling over, which could be a bullet bearish crossover. So it's very likely that we can get a pullback for the uh, Russell 2000 back into this range. This is a fairly big range right here from 150, you know, 650 all the way to 160. But really the reason why is because we had resistance here. We had, you know, almost reached there. And then we had resistance right here perfectly. And then you could see the back test of support right here. And then it acted as support again right throughout here before the breakout. So that zone kind of seems like a big area of support. We had the 50 period sloping up rather fast. So it's going to be interesting to see what takes place. But if we do pull back into this zone, it could be a temporarily good opportunity to buy. And then you just want to stop, you know, just below that. So that was quickly, we just quickly went over uh, three indices right there, mapped out some levels, support, resistance, kind of kind of get a good idea as, you know, what's taking place in the markets. And overall, like my thought process right now is this, we saw a nice big kind of a, I would call it a squeeze to the upside after breaking that neckline and that 618 level that we've been tracking. That was good for long positions. Now I was taking positions in low beta and also high beta, but my low beta positions I picked out from the utility sector and I made sure those positions were pretty solid. The high beta positions, what I did was I, I reduced the amount of risk in higher beta that were outside of those utility sectors. So really overall a pretty strong week, week which I'll recap in my weekly scan when we go over some new stock picks. But now let's kind of just hone in on what is taking place with certain indicators such as the CPC, which we'll go over here, the NIMO, and then the Pring Bottom Fisher to really get a good grasp like, hey, is this a real breakout or is this kind of just like a bull trap? Are we, getting, are we just bringing in some hype and some momentum, some more buyers, and then is the rug going to be kind of pulled out from our legs? And let me kind of walk you through my thought process here. This is the CPC, the options put to call ratio. We smoothed it over a 10 period moving average. Now, what is the CPC? Well, if you're new here, the CPC tracks um, just the options ratios, the options kind of market. And there's two things that make up the CPC, the equity and the index. The equity portion of it, 
which we're not looking at, which kind of it's come obviously combined. The equity portion is a retail traders and retail traders. Typically what you see is the ratio below one, which means relatively more bullish traders when it's when it's below one and when it's above one, it's more bearish sentiment. So the index, which is the more retail institutions, they are typically above one because they're hedging their long position. So what we're doing is we're combining a total. We made an indicator and we're smoothing over 10 period moving average. So how do you read this indicator? First off, let's look where one is. One is at this blue line. We're below one. What does that mean? It means the sentiment of the market is bullish. So right here though, is this 0.8 level and this 0.8 level can act as a sell signal or a, you know a warning sign and really how we read that is when the price action crosses below it's kind of just notify us hey it's a warning things might change here very soon not too sure how long but just keep an eye out and as you can see we haven't crossed yet below it here in october but the last time we crossed below it was right here in the middle of july Okay, so yes, it crossed below. It said, hey, you know, things could get different, you know, a warning sign. But as you can see, it, the stock price went up until it crossed above that line. When it crosses back above from crossing below. So when it crosses there, that's the warning. When it crosses back above, that is the quote unquote sell signal. Doesn't mean you have to get out of all your positions, but it should mean that you need to start taking some profits off the table. It would be a smart idea or hedging your long positions or, you know, just being more of a risk off type trader, look for certain assets or equities that are um, performing in uh, certain performing sectors. So I went through that pretty quickly, but what we're seeing here and why I'm bringing this back up is because we're seeing the decline here moving lower into around 0.8. That could be that warning sign coming saying, hey, yeah, the stock price is kind of going up. People are bullish but pump the brakes here if we get under this and it crosses back above. So we're gonna be monitoring this also day by day to see where this takes us. Let me show you a history lesson right here. We crossed below it right over here. That was a warning. When we crossed above it, just look straight below. When we crossed above it, yeah, we kind of went sideways, but it went down, went up a little bit, but then it went down a little bit more. Now you can't get the effect of this move down to here, but if you look over, that's over 100 points on the S&P 500. Okay, so it crossed above and then we came back down and then look at where it hit and then immediately shot back up from. And that was right before the uh, March sell-off. So a big move in the market, and as you can see, just crossed below it and then went above and then we saw that sell-off take place. Over here, it did the same thing. It crossed down, warned us, crossed above. And if you look right down, it was from here and then boom, right down to down here. So the this is not like a, end all be all, you know, sell signal, holy grail indicator. But what it can at least do for us is tell us when to, you know, pump the brakes versus kind of just going all in on some crazy options calls and just getting burned up by, you know, theta. So this is something that we do want to pay attention to and we will be paying attention to because it is coming to that warning type sign. The next indicator right here is the Pring Bottom Fisher indicator. I've been talking about this one, but I want to kind of like just reiterate once again, this helps find sometimes market bottoms. And what we saw here just a few days ago was it started to cross over. And if you look straight up, we started seeing a pump higher. That doesn't mean that this is just gonna go to all time market highs. That's not what the indicator means at all or in the slightest so don't think like that um if you if you are thinking like okay now it's a buy signal it's doesn't necessarily mean that the lower that the bottom fissure goes when it starts to turn up um like say for example right here at minus 27 the lower it goes so this green line right here is more of a bullish type signal when it goes down that low which it has plenty of times if you hit the chart that's linked in the description you could change the amount of years you're viewing but then you could see really more aggressive moves to the upside. Now, let me point, prove out my point here. When we saw it cross down below 10, so you want it to below 10 at least minimum, and then you saw it cross back up right here. They crossed, so we move all the way up here. And as you can see, it was down slightly, but then it only bounced up just a little bit before ultimately turning down to the downside. So 
We need to use this indicator along with our other indicators to help determine, you know, is this mean something to us? And what I'm seeing here is we saw this go down and then up and then a crash. And now what we're seeing is not down way down here by this real good buy signal. We're seeing it a little bit lower than here, crossed above. So that's a decent sign. We're seeing the price action move higher, right? But we're also seeing the CPC smoothed over the 10 period moving average, moving into that warning signal. So we have some conflict here. So what do we do when there's conflict? We need to just kind of pause and, and, and just pump the brakes a little bit. When we don't have clear direction or just clear momentum, it's very hard to trade these type of market conditions. Now I'm gonna show you one more thing. Now this isn't meant to scare you, this is meant to prepare you. I, I, I say that time and time again, risk management is the number one key factor in all of this stuff. You need to be able to manage your risk to be a successful trader and investor. And if you're you know, just kind of going on with emotion and hopes that you know we can go higher or hopes that the market's gonna crash, chances are, I mean, either way you look at it, you're probably gonna get burned. The market's gonna go up, the market's gonna go down, the market's gonna go up, the market's gonna go down. We just don't wanna get trapped in positions where you know we hold from up here at 3,400 all the way down to 2,200. It's absolutely insane and this will help you you know, overcome that. The last indicator, let's look at the NIMO. So here is the NIMO and we've been looking at it a little bit more zoomed in and what I wanna do is scope out. Now we've been talking about how this looks similar to 2018 and um, the NIMO I changed up a little bit to make it a histogram. Uh, if I said that right, histogram, yeah, I don't know. So that's what I did here to make it look a little bit more cleaner rather than just a line. So really what it says is when it's above zero, you have a positive breath in the market, you have a lot of moving stocks in the upward direction markets moving up together. When it's going below zero, it means that there's a negative breath. There's more technically declining stocks than there are positive stocks moving forward. And what you wanna look for here is divergences. You can look for, um, what I like to look for is, you know, how the market is responding and reacting to previous moments in history. That's how you can use this because you can't really read it without looking back into history. And what we got going on here is very similar to what happened in 2018, and I'll point it out. What we got here was a high in um, September, right? Or early September to um, uh, late August right here, high. Now, if you look down at the McClellan Oscillator, it was done in the red. So that means the market was moving higher from August all the way into September to make an all-time market high, but it was being led by very few stocks. Now you probably heard about the FANG stocks, right? The big FANG stocks move in just incredible market caps, just moving the market higher and higher. But as you can see, other stocks were really deteriorating. So the market made new highs without the help of a lot of other stocks, okay? And then now what we're seeing is here is a very rapid movement from a low point from 0.80 all the way to 0.60 or almost 0.70 in a very short period of time. And that means that the markets, all the stocks are participating in this rally up, not all of them, but the majority of them are, and it's a positive breath and we're getting a sharp move to the upside, all right? In 2018, right here to 2019, so see this big chunk of negative breath right here? Well, if you look up, the market was making a high in 2018 or late 2018. Now, if I, don't, I don't know if you remember late 2018, but there was also a big, you know, just boom around these tech stocks. Everything, everyone was talking about Tesla. Everyone was talking about Amazon. Everyone was talking about all those stocks. And I mean, shortly thereafter, they fell 35 to 50 percent. It seemed like in a relatively very short period of time. But we had the market rise up on a negative breath. Okay. Boom, it fell down, a very similar type of fall that we see right here, a very sharp decline with a couple bounces. And then we saw the market rally sharply up. And if you look down here, it went from a low to a very sharp high. And very similarly, right? And then what we had happen is the sharp decline once it reached this spike of 70. And this area, 70, it's relatively a good indicator say, hey, it, it really depends on the speed that the indicator moves as well from a negative territory, but from a negative territory all the way up to 70 in a very quick spike, kind of says, hey, you know, things are probably gonna have a, a little bit of a turnaround here very, very quickly. 
it's it's too aggressive of a move. It's like stretching a rubber band out and then you get kind of some, some sort of a kind of a little snap back. And what we can do is we're looking at those other indices, right? And we're looking at, for example, Russell 2000. When we looked at the Russell 2000 on the two hour time frame, we were seeing that, yeah, it looks very strong and everything's going good, but there's a negative divergence in the RSI. So there's stocks within those Russell 2000 that is saying, hey, you know, we're kind of reaching these levels. We need to pull back or we need to consolidate. So that's what this is telling me right here. It does not, I'm not saying that means it's going to crash down completely, but you know, this is happening during a very important time in our economy. One, the presidential elections are going on. So that's important. We have all this talk around stimulus. It's, you know, probably going to pass. I don't know if it's going to pass before the election or after. I've I thought that it was going to be before, but then I thought it was going to be after, and now I don't really know. I think that they're going to chop it up. It's it's all kinds of craziness. So, and then we have obviously, like I said, the uh, presidential elections and potential um, civil unrest, and then we also have COVID on top of all of that. So, what do you know? We got all kinds of crazy stuff going. So, if bad news comes out, and I, I feel like if you really think about it, like the politics of everything right now are just really driving this market. It's all about the stock market right now. And it's it shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't see the Dow, by the way, the Dow Jones, swing 500 points every single day. Okay, It shouldn't go up 500 or down you know, 400 every single day. Those are huge moves in the market. And now people are starting to just like think it's the normal. That's not normal to see market moves like that. It's just not. So Yes, like I said, overextended. This looks like if we start looking at certain individual stocks when we're picking out our trades or investing, make sure that they are relatively not moving into a big wall of resistance because if this does pull back, chances are those stocks will too. Here is the US dollar. Uh, this is continuing to get pressure to the downside. It's still not fully, I mean, it's at a critical juncture. And it's not fully broken down quite yet. Although I wanted to point out a very level, important level that it did flush down from. This horizontal line right here I had as an area of support. And then it cracked below it. And as you can see, really flushed to the downside. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, this is over. This can still be the cup and just a longer term handle or potentially it could start consolidating. So we're going to have to watch this and how it reacts in the next few days. But I will say if we start getting movement to the upside and a break above, it's going to apply even more pressure on equities, gold, silver, other assets. And we'll get into the gold and silver here shortly. Uh, but really what I'm thinking now, just to kind of just ease off the, the dollar kind of talk, is one, we have to get above this 94.50 and then 92 is the low. So it's in a channel right now. I'm going to be looking at 92 to basically 95. I feel like if we get above 95, that's going to be obviously very bullish. We're going to see pressure on various assets. If we start cracking below 92, you know, this could fall a lot lower and this basing pattern could just be a complete failure. So we're going to be looking at that. And then in weeks to come, we're also going to be bringing in the yields, the bonds, and we're going to be doing some more intermarket analysis to help us kind of guide through these times. And once we start getting into the sectors, and then start picking out our you know different ways of trading it's going to really help kind of understand the market and all of its kind of nuances that goes on here's a chart of gold gold did extremely well today up 1.64 percent that's 31 dollars. that's a pretty significant move to the upside for gold let's look at the rsi right here we have a low here to a higher low here that's some strength and it's matching the price action that's not bad and then we also have it in the macd crossing up right here it's kind of breaking above this trend line still is below the 50 and yes it was a good day for gold but i've been saying that we need to get above 1950 and recapture the 50 sma for me really to kind of like have confidence in this i was kind of like I'm bullish gold, but I was hoping that it would fall lower just so I can pick up more. You know, it is what it is, but I did buy some when it came to the low portion here, and then I bought more when it came down here, and now my trade, I'm positive on that trade because I bought here and I bought here, so I'm even on this, but I'm, I'm up on that. Now, I buy the physical metal. I didn't buy the paper, so technically I had to pay a premium, so, you know, it is what it is there, but let's go ahead and look at silver. 
Here is a chart of silver. Silver was in this symmetrical triangle, broke down, still had a very big move today. A $1.23 move for the price of silver is big move. That's 5.16% to the upside. It kind of broke through some short-term resistance here at 2450. That's positive. And now it's coming into a new level of resistance right here at 2550. So yes, a bearish move to the downside, a pull to the downside, but the overall context is bullish. And then the pattern here is it's technically bullish. It's an ascending triangle, but unfortunately it was coming from a move to the downside. So, you know, just be careful on this one. We need to, once again, I we got to capture the 50 period moving average. If you look at the RS, RSI up here, sorry, you have a low here to a higher low there. That's a nice, just, just nice showing some strength in the RSI. The MACD right here is also doing that crossing over. That's bullish, not quite above zero yet, but this is a good sign for the precious metals as of this particular moment. Can things change? Yes, things can change. Why did gold and silver go up and why did the dollar go down? Well, and then why did the stock market go up? I mean, this was really a rally on, it was all today was based about was this news around stimulus. And, you know, if more money is going to be flooded into the economy, well, you know, more of something doesn't mean it's always a good thing. So this dollar went down when you get more, when the money supply is expanded, inflation is, you know, I, I, I define inflation. I mean, there's so many different definitions, but it's, it's ex expanding the money supply. So more dollars in existence. Expanding the money supply is inflation. When you expand it, it technically decreases. And you could look at long-term charts to look at that and you could debate about it too, but that's just kind of my view on it. And when the dollar goes down, it makes assets or pr commodities obviously more expensive. You can buy that. You can buy less gold, less silver, less you know, any commodity for um, obviously more dollars. It costs more dollars to buy it when your dollars become less valuable. So yeah, I don't know what, what tangent I just went on right there, but yeah, so we got to make sure that this these price actions continue to the upside. I'm not buying silver until we really got to, we got to recapture strength or we got to break down one of the two. I'll, pull, I'll buy some down here at around probably the 200 period moving average if we break down, but I won't buy any until we maybe get above, mm, gosh, it's a tough one. I'll have to think about it and, and kind of see how the price action is at that particular point in time. But as I see it right now, I'll be buying more of the dips rather than um, the current state until we maybe get into more of these, you know, higher level rips, I guess we can say. All right, everybody, that's all I have for you on today's market brief. I want to ask a question and leave me, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. But these charts, some of them, they're end of day charts and they take a while to load. So would it be better if I just do the recording later at night and then just post it early in the morning before the market opens? Um, or do you want them just to come out later in the day? Uh, let me know. I mean, it would be probably easier to have it out just in the morning or potentially later at night, but in the morning would probably be the most easiest. So you can technically have a real market brief. You wake up, you get to see certain levels and then you get to plan your trades and all that good stuff. So let me know in the comment section below. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.